Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. It is September 1st, 2017. I'm your host, John DeLynn, and I am so excited uh, to interview someone I've been wanting to interview for many, many years, ever since I saw her I'm a Mormon video. Um, her name is Mersa Baradaran, uh, and there's so many cool things about Mersa. Uh, she and her family immigrated to the, to the United States from Iran when she was nine. Her mother was uh, an activist there. We could talk a bit about that. After joining uh, the Mormon Church, uh, Mersa graduated from Brigham Young University, uh, magna cum laude, uh, went on to get a law degree from New York University, uh, became law school faculty at BYU, then University of Georgia, where she now works as faculty there in the law school. Um, she is the author of two books. Uh, the first one is How the Other Half Banks, Exclusion, Exploitation, and the Threat to Democracy. Uh, in that book, uh, she discussed the idea of sort of integrating banks with post offices, uh, and this is for uh, mostly for sort of developing countries. Uh, she's given TED Talks about this idea. Her ideas have been endorsed by Bernie Sanders uh, and others, which is really exciting, Elizabeth Warren. Um, and she's coming out with a new book called The Color of Money, Black Banking and the uh, Racial Wealth Gap from Harvard University Press. Uh, so super successful in so many ways. Uh, but in addition to her successful career, she is the mother of three children, um, she identifies as an immigrant, liberal, Mormon, Muslim, feminist, lawyer, uh, mother uh, who generally dislikes labels. And we'll talk a lot about that as well. Um, we're going to cover several topics in today's episode, race and Mormonism, Mormons and social justice, tribalism and Mormon, ide Mormon identity. Uh, it's going to be what I think kind of a really important epic interview with an important voice. Uh, far beyond Mormonism uh, in the broad uh, intellectual and academic communities. Um, so uh, I'm super excited. Before we actually dive into the interview, I will just uh, make a few very, very quick announcements. Um, as you know, uh, we have a, a Facebook page, Mormon Stories Podcast has a Facebook page. Please like us on, on Facebook, it's helpful. If you want to also help us, you can give us a positive review on uh, Facebook at Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, it takes just a few seconds, and it really makes a difference in terms of helping uh, get the word out there. We have accounts now on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, and if you want, you can give us a positive review on iTunes. Uh, all those things are really, really helpful. As you know, we do workshops and retreats for people who are experiencing uh, Mormon faith transitions. We have a workshop September 14th and 15th in Seattle, Washington. We're, we're going to Sydney, Australia, October 20th through 22nd. We're going to the San Francisco Bay Area, November 9th through 10th, uh, and we're taking nominations for events in 2018. You can email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. If you want to bring a workshop or retreat to your area, you can go to mormonstories.org slash events to see all the events there. And of course, we've got a cruise plan to the Bahamas, October 24th through 28th, as something we're doing for fun. Um, those are our announcements. We try and make them uh, really, really quick and fast because we want to get to the purpose of today's uh, interview, which is Mersa. Uh, so without any further ado, Mersa, I'm so thrilled uh, to have you on Mormon Stories Podcast for the first time. Thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. I'm a big fan. All right. And you're joining us from UGA, uh, your office at UGA Law School. Is that right? Yeah. Go, go dogs. We're playing somebody tomorrow in a Football game is what I hear. Are you an S Are you an SEC football fan? Um, by by <laughs> it is it is un, 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 impossible to avoid being one here. So yes, I think the answer is yes. You've been to games and everything. I've been to two games. One was oppressively hot, and I had to leave. And the other, uh, we won. So I, but you know, I don't know much about football. So uh, all right, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> well, it's fun to. It's so fun to have you on. All right, so. There's so many cool things to cover. I, uh, I, you know, I studied, I was a political science major, in international relations, and I studied, you know, a little bit about the Iran Revolution. Uh, it was a really important moment growing up in the '80s with Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. I just remember a lot of talk about Iran, including a song that came out when I was uh, in middle school called "Bomb Iran." Uh, <laughs> it was a it was a parody uh, to. Um, 
the Beach Boys song, Barbara Ann, it would go bomb, bomb, bomb. You know, I didn't even yeah. want to sing it. But yeah. Iran was a really important uh, mm -hmm. fixture of our consciousness in the 70s and 80s. And mm -hmm. you were born during the Iranian Revolution. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be fun to start um, with you talking about your parents and their ancestry and give us a little bit of an education about Iran about what it was like before the revolution, what the revolution was about, and how your your um, family may have even played a role in it. Do you want to start yeah, there? Or you can start with, with whatever introduction you want to start with. But no, that's absolutely. No, I, so I was born the year of the revolution. So my dad's family is from the south of Iran, and he was born literally on the Silk Road. So, you know, the Silk Road passes from, you know, the, the Orient up until Euro up to Europe, and my um, my my father was from this town, you know, on the Iran-Iraq border as uh, the traders were coming in and he lived in a trade trading town and my grandfather um who lived it's uh, it's called Qasr Shirin, which is um sweet castle it's where the shah one of the earlier shahs had a castle that was on the uh, silk road and my grandfather actually had a silk factory on the silk road and sold sort of silk turbans to kurds and and my dad tells me i mean when the, the town that he grew up in was very um, it, it was a trading town. It was multicultural. So there was, you know, Iranians were Muslims, but there were in his town, there were Jews and Kurds and Arabs and, you know, were Persian. And so there were Persians. And so there was um, a real sort of open-mindedness in, in the town that he grew up. And I think that sort of infects my family. My mom was from the North. Um, so my mom was, uh, both of my, my dad was a surgeon um, and he worked for um, the Shah uh, in, in the police and then he, as, as a doctor, and then he worked later on for Khomeini um, as a transition. My mother was a revolutionary. She was an activist. She was in college, um, was, you know, what you would call a Muslim socialist, not communist in the way we think, but sort of egalitarian. They wanted a democratic government. She was a university student, so she'd go to these rallies. And this is, you know, in the lead up to the rev revolution. And the Shah was, you know, he was an oligarch. He was your, you know, um, took Iran's money and gave it to the West and really pushed down the rights of the uh, peasants and the farmers and the common people. And so the revolution was a, a bunch of different forces in Iran joining together to oust the Shah. And my mom's was an, you know, I intellectual sort of, we need an egalitarian democracy. And so she would go out on the streets and, and revolt and, you know, actually lost her first baby. Um, they, the one at one point in 1977, she was out, you know, uh, protesting the regime and the, the shots that they shot out at the crowd and my mom ran and, you know, that night delivered a baby who couldn't live, you know, because he was um, too young. And then I was the next. So I was her first child, but, you know, the second born. And um, so I was born that year, you know, the year that um, the Shah um, is, is pushed out of Iran. And really, I mean, there's... What, the, what was wrong with the Shah? Like, yeah. he, he was he was kind of an ally to the United States, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a puppet, if, <laughs> right? A puppet ally to the U.S. and Russia. I mean, if you can, Russia and the U.S. were sort of playing the Shah for their own favors and Great Britain. And and to understand the revolution, you've got to go back to 1953, right? So Americans, um, or, sorry, Iranians elected a democratically elected leader. Um, let's call him our Bernie Sanders, but Iranians would say he was our George Washington, right? He was a um, uh, uh, you know, committed to a democracy um, and not a monarchy because Iran had lived under monarchy. So his name was Mossadegh. And what he does is he um, wants to make a democracy, tries to make it, you know, parliamentary, and he nationalizes Iran's oil. And this pisses off Great Britain and the U.S. And, the and that's Great because they need the revenue to be able to function as a society. And at that time, imperialist countries were siphoning the wealth out of Iran in the, Iran, and that would keep them from being able to prosper. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and Iran was strategically important, right? It was, you know, in, in, in the route to where they needed to be. They wanted to pass a railroad through. They wanted to get the oil out. And so when Mossadegh nationalizes the oil, they don't like it. So what they do is they stage a coup, right? They pretend like Iranians are throwing him out of office. And the CIA has, you know, since admitted this, but it was the Dulles brothers um, who, you know, were going around changing a lot of leaders at the time, right? A lot of third world leaders who were notoriously awful people that they would put in as these, you know, you know, democratically elected leaders are out. So Guatemala, Guatemala, Chile, Argentina, exactly. all over the place. Exactly. And so yeah. Iran was, uh, you know, uh, and, and Iranians remember this and they, they, they sort of sowed the seeds of this anti-Western, Westernism and this 
um, suspicion of the West. And so when Khomeini comes in, so the Shah is the puppet that uh, America sort of replaces um, Mossadegh with, right? So the Shah leaves, Mossadegh is ousted by the CIA and the Brits, and then they bring in the Shah and put him back in. And so the Iranians don't like this. And the Shah is just notorious. I mean, he's like a spendthrift, a playboy. He has these huge parties and, uh, you know, spends $500,000 on like caviar and wine. Meanwhile, there are people who are impoverished in Iran, right? So um, Iranians are just discontent brewing and a bunch of different forces come together, right? There are the religious people that want him out because he's going around tearing off headscarves off people. There are the- So he was, sec- he was secular. He was secular. Yes, he was secular. So that, you know, um, now looking at what Iran has become, people say, oh, that that was good. But he was intolerant of religion also, right? So he was not letting Muslims practice their religion there. And so there was that discontent. There was the merchants discontent. And then there was the people who wanted Mossadegh and a democracy's discontent. My mom was in that latter sort. And so, um, you know, they all- talk, Talk really quickly. This is just going to be basic Iranian 101. What's, yeah. A lot of people think Iranians are, are Arabs. Talk, what, what does it mean to be Persian versus Arab? Or can we even really describe the difference? I mean, it used to be a world of difference. I mean, and now we're all sort of, you know, like the other, the scary uh, other people. But to Iranians, we're um, Persians. So we, you know, this is uh, ancient Persia. Um, Arabs were, uh, you know, Persians and Arabs are different races. Um, and so, or however, I mean, race, what is race even mean but like right. you know the, the language was uh, very different the cultures were very different persia has been sort of um, a, a civilization for a long time right this is rumi and hafez and um we we had our own you know when, when it was the greeks we were the persians and there was fights and the greeks won so they got to write history but the persians <laughs> had their own history at the time right. which is longer and deeper and and you know um not to be you know not to put down the Greeks, but I've been to, you know, their, their ruins and Iranian ruins are bigger and better. (laughs) So, you know, we, we ruled the world at one point, we're a fallen empire. um, And, you know, we had, you know, Cyrus and Darius and Alexander the Great, who was a, you know, intruder, but ended up, you know, ruling Persia. Um, So we, so we have a long, rich history of, you know, poets and mathematicians and all this stuff. And, and so do the Arabs, right? But Islam Islam came later to Iran. And so um, Persians sort of adopted Islam, but were never quite um, Muslim fully, right? So Iranians have a lot of our own holidays and traditions. And, you know, this is like Nowruz, right? It's our uh, Persian New Year. And it comes from a Zoroastrian tradition and not a Muslim. So we have a lot of our own Zoroastrian, um, Baha'i, you know, Jewish, like there's a lot of these multicultural things in Iran, which, you know, the Arab world sort of developed through Islam. And so there, there, there is a clash, you know, and there is a, a lot of racism there too. And I, we'll, we'll talk about tribalism later, but everyone has their tribes. And for Persians, even within Iran, there are various tribes of, you know, people who were Kurds from before, Turks or whatever. But as Persians, we've been Persians for like a thousand years and we see ourselves very differently than Arabs. And so when, you know, President Bush comes out and says, oh, the axis of evil is like Iran and Iraq, we're like, wait, we're, we're not even, we're, we're nothing like Iraq. When we fought Iraq for, you know, 10 years. Long that was time, yeah. For a long time, yeah. So, um, so I guess going back to the revolution, it was this, uh, brew, this you know, um, hotbed of discontent and the Shah just kept pushing and pushing. And then it erupted, you know, and um, my mom, go ahead. Does she remember what she, what, what was really motivating her to become act, act, activated as a, as a revolutionary? Like um, what was really getting under your mom's skin? Right. Good, really good question. I think it was, um, it was, uh, it was feminism. Um, it was um, democracy. I mean, they, they wanted, they, um, they wanted to be part of the Western world and, and, and they wanted not, not to be um, American, but they wanted to feel that sort of um, the democratic spirit, right? It was, it was the, he was an oppressive tyrant, you know? And so they wanted to, this was the seventies, right? So there's a global revolution happening and Iran, I think was infected by part of that. She read um, Shariati is this, um, you know, scholar there who was writing um, sort of socialist, not, I want to be very clear, not communist. So we hated Russia just as much as we hated America, but, you know, egalitarian um, uh, tomes. And so my mom was uh, intellectually sort of in, uh, involved in the revolution. And it was uh, a university thing so that she was sort of, you know, at, it was at university where she got to be uh, involved as an activist or so not at some like, you know, guerrilla warfare um, uh, thing and not, at, you know, as part of some, you know, 
group of pro- proletariats. She was a university student. Got it. Okay. And so your early years, I'm sure, were kind of scary or exciting or tragic at times. Can, can you remember what it was like to have a mom who's a revolutionary? Sure. I mean, she was a revolutionary um, when, you know, when I was born and then she um, was part of the, uh, you know, r- r- some revolutionary movements and then she was in prison, right? So she went to Evin, um, which is Iran's notorious uh, prison. This is Khomeini that put her there, right? So she was against the Shah, but then she went against the Khomeini because he was not what they wanted, right? Um, so she was put in prison for several years and that was my childhood. And so during my childhood, I was back and forth. They would let her take us to prison because she was one of the only mothers um, in prison. A lot of them were girls and the, a, lo- a lot of other people were killed. And so she was kept alive. Um, and this is because my dad had a really, um, he was one of the only neurosurgeons left in Iran and he was doing these um, surgeries on the Iraq, Iran-Iraq border. And so they weren't about to kill his wife. And so kept her alive several years that we were back and forth in prison. So I remember that all very vividly. We would go to Tehran and here those were Saddam Hussein's bombs that were raining in on us all, all, you know, all every night, right? So we'd sleep in the basement, gas masks, and then we'd go up and stay with my mom in prison and back to Tehran. And so, you know, it was, it was tumultuous. There wasn't food um, often, not because we didn't, you know, we just, the, the, people weren't shipping in food to Iran, right? You're at a war zone. And so everything was, you know, insecure, right? We were um, very, very scared. But at the same time, it was my, it was all I knew, right? I didn't have any other thing to compare it to. And so that was life. And I do, I live sometimes like a refugee. I, I, you know, I I have this mentality of when my kids complain, I'm like, you have no idea how lucky you are. You know what I can really say? Like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) we had bombs and we didn't have stuff. And my mom was like, like, where's my Xbox controller, right? Like, you know, (laughs) you have food, you have shoes, shut up. And my, you know, and even as a mom, you know, parenting, I think a lot of people, I, I hear my fellow moms like put a lot of pressure on themselves. And I feel like, look, I turned out fine. And my mom was like, never there, right? Like she was locked up um, as I was growing up and, and we managed, you know, between the family and um, the school system, we just kind of did it, you know? Um, so that was my life. And then, um, uh, and then, you know, my mom had her own struggles with Islam and uh, my dad was, um, you know, an atheist, I think for most of that. And they were, they were angry at Islam, you know? Um, and so we um, were able to come as refugees here to America in 1986. So Thank how you. was she, she was let out of prison? <laughs> so this is an awesome story too. My dad um, got a call one night. It was one of the high ranking mullahs um, up in the north of Tehran. And he got on a helicopter plane in the dead of night, went over there, operated on him. And then the second he did, he's like, you know, his sons came to him and said, we thank you, you're saving his life. What do you want? And he's, and my dad says, I want an appointment with Raf Sanjani who ends up, who's a head of Iran right now. So he sits in front of Raf Sanjani and he's like, get my wife out of prison. And that day he sort of signed her out and she had served three years and got out. Um, and then uh, after that, my dad was able to, you know, hook up something at UCLA so we could come out here and got miraculously, truly, I mean, really got lucky to get visas um, to come for one year um, to America. And then we were able to plead asylum once we got here. Got it. Wow. Such drama. And that was 86-ish when you got here? 86. Yeah, I was going to say thank you, Ronald Reagan. for. Uh-huh. Do you mean that sincerely? <laughs> I do. Absolutely. I mean, he, you know, he had an administration that was tolerant. Iranian immigrants were not welcome, you know, as you know, right? We were, and I did, when I was in elementary school every morning and during recess and after school, I would shout death to America, death to Israel. You know, this was the country that I grew up in. This was the, this is who we were at the time. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what America was. And if you'd asked me at the end of the day, like, hey, do you want to go to America? I'd be like, when can we leave, right? I mean, <laughs> it, it wasn't like, I, I didn't hate anybody, but this is this is the, the image of Iran, you know? And, uh, and it was a purposeful, it was propaganda by the regime, right? And so, you know, uh, nobody was really accepting Iranian immigrants and we um, lucked out at the time. So most Iranian immigrants came in 78. We, we were very different from that sort. We came with nothing. Um, my dad had skills, obviously, but we didn't have money when we when we came here. And so my parents worked in, you know, um, just hard labor. My mom was at her dry cleaners. My dad was driving trucks, um, just kind, kind of scrapping it together. He did eventually take all the tests again and become a doctor when I was um, in high school. So, but most of my life here was, uh, you know, poor immigrant kids um, living in real poor areas. And I wouldn't tra- trade it for the world, but that, you know, I had a, 
a different sort of childhood than most people. I, you know, wasn't really playing much, didn't have much. Um, and, and, and again, I, I'm grateful for it. How were you treated by your classmates uh, being uh, darker skinned from a different country? Did you have an accent at the time? Like, you know, when I, I got here in third grade and um, I learned English in like three months. And part of it, I think, was psychological, like get me out of that country. Like I hated it. Like I'm going to be an American. And so I learned very, very fast. And I think I slipped in in that window where I didn't have an accent. Um, I was dark skin. Right. And in California, where we first landed, I was just Mexican. And I fact, oh, uh, my gosh, that's terrible. <laughs> well, it was fine. I mean, they not, put not it, to be Mexican. No, being no, Mexican no, is no. not terrible. But being sure. just assumed you're a completely different culture well, that would just the be first, crazy the first week they put us in that in the just spanish classroom you know and it took them a while to figure out like you know these guys don't know what they're doing <laughs> they, they don't even speak spanish and you, you know? spoke farsi right we spoke farsi yeah okay. and so there was no you know farsi transition at the time so we just had to learn it like kind of cold turkey and we did um and we kind of threw ourselves into it so um so so you know in california it wasn't a problem but when we were in sort of whiter districts of course you know i just we didn't have friends and it wasn't just the race, although that was a huge part of it, but it was also, we just, you know, didn't have the right clothes and we weren't watching the right stuff. We were, we were weird and, and different. And, you know, so, so it really was, um, we were heavy, heavy outsiders and then we kept moving. So it wasn't like we could make friends. We were moving every year, um, around. And so, you know, I, um, I have said this before in, in, you know, um, variety of times, but I don't know what it's like to have a tribe. You know, I don't have a, a home or group of people, even, even in Iran, we were, it was so, um, it's such a tumultuous time that there was, I don't have any place in the world right now or any people right now where I can say, these are my people, you know? And, and honestly, the closest I have to that is the Mormon church, which is crazy because I think, you know, I don't think a lot of Mormons see me as like, oh, she's our people. You know, I'm, I'm so different from everything that is Mormonism, but the Mormons, you know, kind of got us right off the gate, right? We kind of, we came to LA and um, the missionaries is two sisters who were lovely, knocked on our door. And my dad was working at the hospital there at UCLA doing um, an internship. And he so met So was that us. first year? Was that first year you're there? First year, like, what missionaries are knocking on your door. Knocking on our door. And they, they were sent by this woman who was Iranian and LDS at my dad's work. And so they came and these, these sisters were like, we couldn't have lucked out with better sisters. I mean, they were both like liberal and open-minded and kind of like hippy dippy. So they were just like playing guitar with us and watching movies with us. And, you know, my mom was like, I want to learn English and these guys are great. And my mom, you know, um, was not religiously minded, but she's a very spiritual person and she felt good with them. And she also was grasping for some sort of American religion. She was very fearful of what would happen to the, her three daughters in this like, you know, terrible uh, country that ruins women in, in her eyes, you know? And so she was very drawn to the no alcohol, no sex before marriage, like the structure of the Mormon church, which she could relate with coming from a Shiite tradition, right? There's just a lot more in common here as far as like raising of women, you know, she, yes, she was a feminist. So she had issues here and there, but as far as like, um, what, what made her comfortable, it really made her comfortable. And so we got baptized, you know, um, right away. And so 1986, right when we got here or, or seven and, you know, my mom wore her headscarf to her baptism <laughs> so and wouldn't take it off for, you know, months afterwards. It took her some like, you know, explaining to, and, and her just kind of getting used to not being uh, Muslim. And then we, we went to church. My dad never really converted. Um, and then my mom has since sort of um, left and it's gone back. I mean, I think she's much more comfortable in the Muslim faith, although she's sort of, she's just a spiritual person and she reads everything and she's as much Buddhist and Hindu and Muslim as she is anything else. So she just, she's all over. And my dad is kind of like, no thanks, <laughs> but, but very accepting. I mean, they're both very, very open-minded. I mean, you have to be, if you're an immigrant here, right. um, you take it as it, as it comes. A couple quick comments from our listeners. Matt writes, it's all about perspective. Hearing stories like this definitely makes me appreciate my life more. Um, <laughs> you should. And then, and then Kyle writes, wow, this makes America's problems seem juvenile. That's what it's, <laughs> um, anyway, I want to encourage listeners to feel free to share comments or questions for, for Marissa. Uh, Niles, my, me, my old uh, BYU roommate, Niles, uh, writes, did your mom wear the headscarf for cultural or religious reasons? Um, I think both. I think, you know, it, it, 
both. Um, I think she felt comfortable with the headscarf, right? When you're told that this is the thing that you need, you know, it, it's, it's hard to sort of change your mindset at that age, you know? Yeah, um, and, and it's, it's tough. I mean, religion, I think really, um, there is that guilt sort of thing built in there. And so when you, you were to say like, for those of your listeners who took off their garments, like, how did that feel, right? How long did it take um, to do that? And I think for my mom, it was the same thing. Like, okay, maybe I'm, yes, I'm part of this new religion now, but this is this thing that I wear every day. And how do I? Uh, yeah, for sure. Out? For sure. Yeah. Uh, that, that makes sense. Now in, in modern sort of times, there's this idea that if you could, that converting from Islam to another religion is dangerous. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound like that was for your mom. So how do we make sense of that perception versus your mom's experience? I think it was always dangerous. I and mean, I think there's different Islams, just like there's different cultures. I mean, uh, Iranian and Shiite were, uh, despite what it seems, much more of a liberal brand of Islam than others. Um, there is no, you know... Um, Sharia law that's strictly enforced, although it's gotten, it did get worse for a while. We're, we, you know, Iranians tend to be pretty tolerant. And, and like, you know, you, we were talking about before the Islamic regime, the Iran that my parents grew up in was, you know, very uh, Western and secular and cosmopolitan. So, uh, you know, the, the hardcore Muslim regime is, is new. And so we, we were worried, but not um, that we weren't going to get stoned to death or anything. Got it. Okay, so what was your experience like in the church as a as a teen? Um, lovely. I mean, uh, it was great. De I mean, depending on what ward we were in, um, but more or less we were accepted um, and um, not, you know, part of like the the cool kids in church, but definitely. Um, I had friends. I went to girls' camp, um, you know, and I was in New York, and so it. Um, we were accepted and we were never, I mean, because we were part member family and we were converts, um, you know, we were never part of the hardcore Mormon right groups, but, um, uh, and it's, we were often the sort of like service family in the, in the ward. Right. And we were poor, but also, you know, different. And so it must've been hard to be poor relatively to everyone else. And so educated, was that hard? Um, my parents are really humble people. And so they, they were just, they felt like I, all, all the sense I always got was that they were just, they felt lucky to be here. And, and we were, you know, and my dad, he just doesn't have errors. Like, yes, he's educated, but he, he was fine not making money. And, and he knew that he, what he knew, and he's still like this. I mean, he's just one of these people who just doesn't put on air. Like if people mistake him for the gardener, he just goes with it. You know, he's um, this short, dark man who uh, is, a highly educated brain brain surgeon, one of the smartest people I know, but he would never show you that. So, so I, it was. I mean, I think we were more prideful, um, but we didn't know uh, status really, and it, it didn't matter to us as much. Um, it was. I mean, in college, it got to be annoying um, to always be like the you know, again, like the Mexican friend or the, you know, um, it, it was, it was, I mean, it was funny at BYU, I joked, like I, I was like the salsa club girl, right? So I would walk around campus and some return missionary would come up to me and be like, did I see you at salsa club? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> and it was, you know, they saw someone that looked like me at salsa club, but you know, so it was, it was hard. Um, I should say, I mean, and, and this is a, will sound trivial, but it wasn't, it was an, an issue of identity at BYU, which was, that I wasn't, um, I, the, nobody asked you out. And, and I don't mean this to sound like I would, I'm complaining about not going out on dates and stuff, but my first semester at BYU, I went into my big Mormon, Book of Mormon class, like I can't remember who the teacher was, but huge auditorium. And it was in the days of like overhead projectors. And the teacher put, would have a quote every day. And um, the first or second week of class, the quote was like, thou shalt not date between races, you know, or some sort of like interracial dating thing and, or marriage. And, and I just got red in the face. I was front row. And I'm like, who am I supposed to date? Right? Like I, there are no other Iranian Mormons. There were actually like one and I tried with that guy. I really did. <laughs> but, but it was, I, I felt like I was told a lot by, by friends. Like I, you know, you're great, but I could never 
take you home. I can never marry you, you know? And, and, and it felt like a doctrine, you know? And I know not all, you know, men felt this way, but it, it became a thing. And I, I was also, you know, I was pre-med, I was a feminist. I was, you know, there's a lot. It wasn't just race, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I, but it felt like, I felt like a pariah at, at BYU. I mean, maybe everyone feels, um, you know, outside, but I, I felt, you know, so I just kind of, and, and it was fine. I just spent four years inside of a library and I studied hard and I got four O's every semester. And so maybe it worked out, but I didn't have much of a social life there. And, and a lot of it was race, um, a race and, and a certain bit of this, what you were talking about, like feeling a little bit resentful that I wasn't taken seriously anywhere. You know, um, I, I felt like people didn't, they wanted to put me in this, like, you are a mission field person and those there were some elders that came back who wanted to date the salsa club girls and then the rest of them w weren't and so and, and it, that could have just been the story that i heard but i i did feel a little bit of resentment just at byu but before then no it, i mean byu was very very white in that time this is, this is the 90s um very white very conservative i remember there was one um campus-wide poll of um, how is Bill Clinton doing as president, right? So I walked by, it's like freshman year, and I was like, great, I love him, right? And I got a call that night, and it was like the campus, whatever, Republicans had put out the survey, and of like 2,000 responses, I was the only person who approved of Bill Clinton as a president at the time. <laughs> and they were like, can you come to a debate? And I was like, I'm like a freshman. I'm not even a poli sci <laughs> major. So there's no way I'm going to a debate. But, you know, it was, that's how it felt. Like, it felt like you, you're the only one with your set of beliefs that looks like you. And so it was certainly um, an alienating experience. For, for the first time in the Mormon church, I think I felt like, oh, like, we are different. This is not, um, I, I'm not part of this clan, like I thought I was. Did all those differences drive you to work harder and to achieve more, do you think? I was going to drive hard and achieve anyway. <laughs> and what is that? Is that just you or is that what you, your family? I mean, I think it's, yeah, I think it's growing up in a war zone and being an immigrant and knowing uh, poverty and alienation and, um, and, and part of it is it could be genetic. I mean, I had two parents that were uh, hard drivers. Who knows? You know, I don't uh, credit myself here. I think like, you know, looking at my family, we're all this way. And so. Okay. You know. What was your, what was your spiritual life like kind of high school into BYU? Did you, did you kind of seek to get the traditional testimony? Did you get the burning in the bosom? Did you read the Book of Mormon? Were you a doctrinal Mormon? Was it more of a cultural thing? Talk about your religious spiritual life during that time. Yeah, good question. I mean, look, I was gro growing up in a family that one, you know, my mom is, believes anyone who tells her that they see God, she's like, I believe you, you know? And then my dad, who is like, it's a seizure, you know? Um, so, <laughs> so, so I was, you know, between these, and I think I was closer to my dad than my mom here. And I um, had, I have, I've always had a doubting mind, you know, I've always been like, prove it to me. Cause I can't, you know, I remember, um, you know, high school seminary, we went out like in the yard and we, like tracked out what the Noah's Ark would look like. And it was like, okay, someone stand there and then someone stand over there. And this is how big the Ark was. And I'm sitting there and I was like, there is no way. Like that just didn't happen, you know? And, you know, we went to, I went to the Sacred Grove when I was, you know, 14 or whatever and um, passed by and it was, everyone was having this like, I know it experience. And I was like, ah, you know, and I just was impervious to those kind of, like I couldn't cry during testimony meeting at girls camp, which is just like, that's being a pariah in and of itself, right? You can't <laughs> must muster the tears to cry during testimony meeting. So I just, I never, I never really had that kind of relationship with the church, but that was just who I am. It wasn't the, the church. I think that any religious upbringing I'd had, I was going to be sort of like touch and go. Um, I did, you know, I, I, my main struggle has been like, you know, between being an agnostic or an atheist about God. So I, I, I was never a literal believer in, in, in any of it, but I, I loved the Mormon community and I felt good in it. Um, and so I, I had, I have wavered on and off in my life about what, what is God and what does that look like? And, and, and I'm not even close to that. And I, you know, I went on a mission, right? So I, but, but I, I had bouts of atheism, you know, not, I should say bouts of atheism as though it's like a disease, but like I had, <laughs> I have been out, you know, I, I, I read, I'm a, a reader. I read constantly. I've always read. And so I, 
was reading a lot of philosophy and a lot of science in high school and in college and a lot of this, you know, um, racial history. And I just, I, I couldn't sort of summon the God that I was told to believe in with what I knew of world history and facts and, and evolutionary theory and all of this stuff. And so I, I struggled. Um, the summer before my mission, I was fairly certain there wasn't a God. And I um, was kind of went on a mission on a lark, like, I, I'm just going to see this through and see what happens and um, see what is sort of revealed to me or I was open to it. And, 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 and I think I had mixed experiences on my mission. You know, I was a really good missionary, um, you know, where'd you go? I went to Houston actually. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, Do you serve in Katy, my old, my old hometown? No, I was always in the city. I was, uh, cause it was Spanish speaking. So I was always with the, an undocumented immigrant. Oh, you fit right in. You spoke Spanish. I did. I know. <laughs> and they're actually surprised. They're like, why is your accent so funny? Like, are you from <laughs> Colombia? <laughs> like, <laughs> it was always like some other country that like surely. Um, so yeah, I fit right in and it was, it was a great experience and I would do it again. Um, but you know, um, I taught on my mission. I taught what I, what I knew and what I thought would be helpful. I didn't stick to um, the, the dogmas and the beliefs that I just didn't hold dear. But I, you know, I still feel like um, I was trying to do a service there, and I, um, uh, you know, it was good. And, and it, again, it was mixed as far as like beliefs. Um, and and I, I've always had, I think, a more slippery relationship with belief and doubt. And and there was a lot of times in my experience, I think would would be, I hoped that there was stuff, but, um, I, I didn't know, and I didn't need to know. Um, and I, you know, one of my favorite, um, writers is Alain de Botton, who says, you know, one of the most boring questions you can ask of a religion is, is it true? And I believe that I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's about community and tribe and what is true. How do we know? I mean, what, I, I think I know what, what is true, but you know, it, I don't know if it's helpful to me in, in my life. Did you ever feel just like I got to talk to someone, I got to talk to the bishop or my mission president or my mom because I can't, I'm not like everybody else? Or did you just sort of accept who you were and kind of own it and feel comfortable in it? Um, I wish I, I yeah, that's a good question because why didn't I? But I, 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 I was so sure that there wouldn't be anyone that could relate that I didn't bother, you know? Um, I no, I, I didn't think you know, and I've I guess I've always been very very independent too. Like I'm sure I'll figure this out on my own, <laughs> you know, and and that's that's a weakness I think. Um, so I never went to authority. I I, I have a hard um, time with authority anyway. So Got I it. never really <laughs> relied on authority. It's in your history. It is exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, how did you? Was there uh, a point where you were sort of looking around? at the role of women in the church and thinking about your feminism, did you ever have sort of a, a feminist crisis as a, let's just say a young adult Mormon? Absolutely. I mean, that was the big, and this is where my dad, I mean, my dad was just like, do not let them to, cause they were like, we can, we brought you to America. We have three daughters. Do not let them convince you that you can't have a career. Do not let them tell you that your role is to be a, a wife and a mother. You know, and my dad was very, very clear on this because here again, my dad is like, I came here, did all this sacrifice and it's for you guys to get your education and have a career. That was very, very clear. And my first year at BYU, I came back and I was like, dad, like, I think I want to just be a wife and a mother. And he's like, no, Cool, you know, and so, so that really was my struggle at BYU. Is I I, I did I think um, struggle a lot with that, right? Because there was a, there was a lot of pressure on women at BYU um, to not have careers. I was in my pre med classes, and I was one of the only women in there. And I and I remember, you know, my organic chemistry, I aced it, right? Um, and and my teacher brought me out um, after class, uh, really great guy, and he was like, "Don't let anyone tell you that you you can't be a doctor." I was getting like number one grades and it was all blind, you know, and, um, and I, I wasn't getting treated nicely by my classmates and colleagues, just fine. Um, but, but, you know, he, he felt like he had to pull me out and tell me that. And I was, you know, I was involved in voice at BYU, which was the feminist group at the time. I was very involved in that. And that was my refuge. And there's, you know, where all the gay students were and all the sort of misfits and broken toys. And I was there for like the feminism. And I, um, I, th that was, I guess, as, as much community as, as I could find there. But it, that, that was a huge struggle at BYU because it, it felt like 
I can't believe that I'm fighting these, these ba battles, but it's hard not to get swept up in, oh, well, maybe I'm wrong, right? That, that was, I think, where I wavered most in my, what I was, um, what I came in with in this idea of like female value. And, and that, that was a real struggle um, because I felt like it was really, um, it was in the water at BYU. I mean, all of my friends, I think were, um, you know, uh, just preparing for marriage. And um, here I was, you know, I, I, I got to go to med school or law school or something. And it was, it was an, it was very important to me and I wanted to, you know, be involved in these groups. And I just, uh, again, I, I think um, it, I was so, I felt so different. And now I think it's, it's a bit different uh, now, right? But at the in the time, church, in the church now. In the church and at BYU. Yeah. Um, but at the time there was, there were few of us who were dead certain that sure. we were going to have careers and not be stay at home moms. Did you just write that off as like a cultural artifact, you know, or did you try and reconcile it religiously or spiritually at all? Or I did. I tried religiously. I, I didn't, that, that's where I, I wasn't sure about what, what God, if there was a God wanted of me. I, I really did feel a lot of guilt, still do. I mean, I still feel s somewhere in my psyche, you know, am I doing the right thing? And, and maybe that's religious, maybe that's cultural. Um, right. But, you know, it, being a working mom, you know, and then being one who grew up in a Mormon church, I think that's tough for any anyone. And then I have to ask, on the one hand, you weren't, you know, Hispanic or from Latin America, um, and you weren't of African descent. So even though, may, may, you know, I think you self-describe as a person of color, um, I wonder how those me messages mm -hmm. about race in the Book of Mormon and the church's history with African Americans, I wonder how you process that, um, given your background. Oh, I mean, I felt like a person of color. I, I felt closer to being, you know, African or Me Mexican than I did be being white. I mean, I'm obviously not white. I was not seen as white. And it was on my mini, I, took, I did a mini mission in the Bronx um, and uh, went out with the sisters and this gentleman came up to us, African-American, and he was like, your church didn't baptize black people until 1978. I was like, no, that cannot be true. Oh, you didn't know that until your mission. No idea. Mini mission. Oh, oh mini mission, yeah. Yeah. So I was 16, and I was like, that cannot be true. There's no way. Like, wrong, you know? <laughs> and the sister had to be like, no, that's true. And I, like, my heart just sank. I couldn't believe it, you know? And it was one of those, like, you know, uh, the, the, it just, it, it all fell apart for me at that moment. Like, I was like, how can I, what, what are you talking, you know, so that was a huge, huge moment. And, you know, at BYU, I, um, I knew Eugene England. Um, I went to London, um, a study abroad, and, and we had a lot of conversations there about blacks and the priesthood and talked very openly about how this was wrong. I mean, I was always sure that this was wrong. This was not something that God could have wanted, but I, I, I struggled a lot with the church and race um, at BYU. Again, that was another factor. It was like the feminism and the, and the race. I mean, it's not easy to be a person of color in the Mormon church. I mean, you feel like, you know, I mean, just one example, my mom's patriarchal blessing, right? Um, mine was like Ephraim, right? Whatever. My mom, the patriarch, said that she was from the tribe of Esau, which is not one of the chosen tribes. Okay, Esau <laughs> is like the cursed Esau. Esau. So it got, so she went, she was like, are you sure? And then it actually got kicked up several notches. Like Esau, like that's not a promised, right? That's not Joseph. And it's certainly, it's not even like, you know, he like sold his birthright. And so they were like, just leave it, you know? But, but so you grew that's up. That's so weird. It was weird. You know? Esau I, wasn't one of the 12 tribes, right? No, it was of Jacob and Esau. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so it was, you know, we always felt like, you know, uh, we were adopted in and, and, um, you know, I, even like, um, I was in a Sunday school class and someone was, you know, talking about like, when you talk about Babylon, right? I mean, that's my country. Like Babylon is, I mean, it's Iraq, but it's also Iran. And so when you talk about Babylon in the historical sense, like it's hard not to feel that. And Americans are so, um, or Mormons are so into that, like, you know, uh, where Jerusalem and Israel is the, is the, uh, promised land, like geographically, which means necessarily that Babylon is the cursed land geographically, right? And so we don't think about that other half, but th those are the people that w I descended from. I'm Babylonian, right? And so I, I, I felt um, that a, a lot and just the way that, um, it, and, and again, I think for me, the, inter the interracial marriage thing was where it hit home the most. Like I, you know, that's what you care about in college is who are you dating and who, you know, that's part of it. You know, it wasn't like as supremely important to me as it may have been for other people, but it was important enough that it was, 
it was so clear to me that I wasn't going to be accepted um, as a marriage partner. And it was because of these myths of race and you weren't going to take me home, right? Like you weren't going to marry an Iranian into your like big Mormon family. And so um, uh, th that's when I first felt like, oh, like I'm never going to be accepted as, as such. And so if, if you think about your profile, uh, you know, feminist, intellectual, mm -hmm. uh, person of color, uh, struggling with racism, atheist dad, somebody could imagine that you graduate from BYU and you're just out of the church, but that's not what happened. But before necessarily, at least not immediately, or, or we could talk about that, but what made you choose law school over med school? Um, you know what? I think it was um, this pressure of not, of, of, of wanting a more flexible job because I thought that if I went to med school, I would be taking too much from my kids, you know, and I, it was, I was set for med school. Like I had the grades, I had all of this stuff and it was just this last minute, like, uh, like it's too much and I need to be home for my kids and, and all of this stuff. Uh. And, you know, I, I don't regret it at all, but it was a decision rooted in that. Um, was your dad a little bummed? Yeah, oh yeah, a lot bummed. I mean, totally yeah. bummed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I should say like the person that I did marry who, you know, I'm still head over heels in love with is, uh, half Mexican or half Mexican, half white, um, Mormon, um, at BYU, I met him, but had a different idea of race, you know, and was a liberal. And so he was like the, you know, the one guy who was like, I don't care what race you are. You know, he says like he used to date across the racial spectrum, you know? So was he from the colonies in Mexico? Um, no, Mexican, like from Mexico, Mexico, okay, okay, yeah. okay. His, his mother's side was Mexican and, but old Mormon Mexican. So his great, great grandparents were like, Mexican Mormons not not having been sent there into, into the colonies. Got it. So you guys met while you were still in your undergraduate? Um, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you go to NYU law school. Yes. Yeah. And we both went there and he uh, got into NYU as well. And we, um, you both know. Both in I, law school at the same both time? Both in law school at the same time. Oh, yeah. and you got married as, as an undergraduate then? Um, we got married as undergraduates. Yeah. After my in, mission, after his mission. Mm -hmm. In the temple. In the temple, LA and, temple. And your dad couldn't go. Could not go. Well, and your sisters, could they go? I guess. Yeah, they, my sisters could go. Um, I guess they weren't endowed at the, no, no, no. Yeah. One of my sisters was, but the others, um, yeah. But, well, but not, what was that like not having your dad uh, um, at your wedding? Hard, you know, hard. Yeah. Um, hard. But, you know, I had always known that, right? And I, go, growing up, like I'd always known that my dad was not part of this thing that we did, you know? So it wasn't a surprise. It was hard. We also, we had two weddings, right? So we had that wedding. And then the big one was this Iranian wedding that we had. And um, so we did like the act, which is the Iranian cultural thing. And my, we had this huge party. And so it was kind of like you do both, you know? Oh, that, well, that's, that's okay. Yeah. That's not too yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we went to BYU to NYU and, you know, my husband was, you know, again, like totally okay with us, me having a career and that was always understood. And so we both went to New York, um, stayed in the church because in New York, you know, you, you can have, you can be a misfit, uh, not sort of an insider and, and, uh, have a church community. And so we, I, you know, basically grew into an adult there. I lived there for a decade, had all of my children in New York, um, and, and had, you know, a thriving church community there and, and was part of that. Was it Brooklyn? What part of New York? No, um, we lived downtown and then we lived in Harlem. In okay. Harlem. Mm -hmm. And what types of jobs did you have while you were living in New York? Uh, so I went to finish law school and I worked on Wall Street at a big law firm. And then um, I stayed home for uh, two years uh, as I wrote. And then I got recruited by BYU to teach um, at the law school there. Okay. So you go to BYU Law. Um, mm -hmm. What was that like? <laughs> going back, going back to BYU. Yeah, you know, it was um, it, it's different going as a professor than as a student, right? So, um, you know, and it's it's a, a mixed bag. I um, was a new teacher, so I you know struggled teaching, um, but there were it was it was it was a good experience. Um, it was hard in some ways. It was um, rewarding in other ways. You know, I felt like I could be a female mentor to my female students, and that nothing could be more rewarding. I mean, they came to me and they're like you can do this, right? You know, and I, I, several of them told me that I was the first female professor that they'd ever had who, you know, had children or 
was managing both. I had male students who told me that I was their first professor that was female ever. And I also had male students who didn't respect me. I, you know, I had a lot of that as well, you know? Um, so it, you know, it really, I mean, it's, it's a patriarchal, it's a male dominated, um, place. And so you, you deal with that as a, a, a woman, as a woman of color, as a junior, um, scholar. I, I was appreciated there though. I felt like the faculty liked me and, um, I was not pushed out. Um, I left, you know, on my own. Um, I, you know, there, there are, it, it has a lot of room for improvement institutionally and in how it treats women. Um, a lot of room for improvement. Um, and, you know, how the students perceive of their female professors. You know, I'm, I, I walk into rooms here and my students just respect me. I've been teaching this for eight years. I'm a, you know, scholar and they assume that, you know, and at BYU, I felt like they never did. They never took me seriously. There's, you know, rumors and my students would just, I, I heard, you know, that, oh, you know, she only got the job because she's a woman of color. And I was just like, how do you know, right? Like, you know, and I, I wasn't, I was a productive scholar, you know, and more productive than other white male faculty members, but you couldn't convince that. It's not a war you're going to win um, by convincing someone, right? And so there was, a, there was a, a little bit of that that I heard that kind of got under your skin. So you, you only stayed there two years, if I read your uh, yeah. info correctly. Was, was that partly because of just success you were having? Or was that partly because of dissatisfaction? To what do you attribute that short stay at BYU? Both. Um, I, I got recruited from other schools. Um, and, and I... George was certainly a step up, I would say. I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, for a lot of uh, for a lot of reasons, it was a good move for us, and um, it was it was a good move for me, and my career could flourish here, and I could, you know, I I, I felt like um, there I was always going to be like the person who got hired because she was a woman of color, and BYU desperately needed her, and I needed to I, maybe I needed to to show that I didn't. I wasn't. I was. I was marketable on the broader market, and um, not not just that it was j just to make a case, but um, I also fell in love with Athens, um, and I love it here. And I didn't have any. I loved living in Utah. You know, um, loved it, and I hated it, but I also loved it. And um, but it, it, it was a positive move. I think. What What years were you at uh, at BYU? What years? Oh gosh, I think twenty ten to twenty twelve. Um, Okay. All right. Um, so that's when, that's when the Mormon internet starts really heating up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't need to go there. What I want to talk about next, I think, is your, your scholarship, your career. So mm -hmm. the, the two books that you've written, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read the titles again. Um, one is How the Other Half Banks, Exclusion, Exploitation, and Threat to Democracy. The other is The Color of Money, Black Banking, and the racial wealth gap. Talk, if you don't mind, about how you ended up going into those sorts of areas. Describe the area, what what led you to that field, and mm -hmm. then how it developed uh, over time. Yeah. So I worked on um, I worked on Wall Street in the banking um, house at, at a law firm, right? So I was in the banking group and doing banking regulation, and this was, you know during the financial crisis. So from 2005 until 2010, when I went to BYU, I was in the middle of like so this- So the big, the big short stuff, the big short exactly, stuff. Exactly, exactly. And I was at one of the two law firms in Manhattan that had a big banking department. So we represented everybody. I mean, the New York Fed, we represented AIG, Goldman Sachs, Lehman, Bear Stearns. We were on one side or the other. And so wow. I was in the hot seat, seeing it all. And so I got a really interesting perspective and knowledge of the banking system and how that works. And, um, you know, I've always, and I wrote a bunch of articles when I got to BYU about that. And then the books really came out, I mean, kind of melded my, I've always been, you know, progressive, you know, believe in equality and, and social justice, especially for uh, poverty, right? Like I've seen poverty from both sides, you know, and I think there's um, the system as I saw it, you know, from the Wall Street side, and then I see it from the people I know who are poor, who struggle, right? I mean, as, as someone who was poor, I've served with undocumented people. I know uh, the struggles of poverty and I know that the, the system doesn't help those people. And so I've taken sort of my, my view, my knowledge of banking and my 
desire to, you know, have a more equal society. And, and these two books are reflections of that. So how the other half bank is, is about that, right? Just we've got an unequal divided banking system and poor people pay a lot more for loans than rich people do. And part of that is a government policy decision. And so that was the first book. This book um, was a racial history of race and capitalism and how that plays out in, in banks. And it's, I, I love this book. I hope that, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I hope that, that, the, the people that I want to read it will read it and people who are interested in racial history in, in the U S I, I did a lot of research for this book. I spent all this time in the Nixon archives and in, you know, bank history. I've looked at tons of bank balance sheets. And what I'm saying here is that, you know, this, the systems of segregation and, and racism, this is the, for the black community was um, impeding this growth of wealth. And I've shown that through the way the balance sheets of these banks worked. And it's not a technical book. It's, it's a, it's a broad history. Um, it's, I think it's very readable. And, and I, you know, I've, I, I've been lucky that um, policymakers have, have um, re read my books and, and listened to some of the, the solutions that I have. And I think, you know, as an outsider and I, constantly consider myself an outsider to everything. And as an outsider, I think I've been able to see these systems and say, hey, here are some problems, here are some possibilities, um, and, and here are some ways that they can improve. So I, if it's okay, I want to go back and kind of dig into both books just a little bit. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sure. first of all, you're not a trained historian, but it sounds like you're doing history. Is that right? Yeah, I'm doing legal legal history. And so yeah. I'm not you know, trying to go into archives just to say something new, but, but then, you know, you end up like doing this history that no one's done. And so you have to go into the archives, right? I, I wish that the, some historian had, had looked into, you know, what Nixon did with, did with black capitalism, but nobody has done it. And so you, you go in there and you try to dig up the sources and I'm, you know, offering it as a, a way to, to show the legal arc of this. But yeah, so I've, I've had to do some history. Um, okay. So if you can take us, take us into the mind and life of uh, let's just say a poor person or someone in the third world and what their life is like as it relates to how banking should or should not or is or isn't uh, and a, a resource for them so that mm -hmm. we can get into the mindset of what led to your idea of integrating banks with post offices. So talk about the yeah. life of, the, of that person. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I actually take things from a system approach and not from an individual approach. So it, it's all, it's, it's American. Okay. Banking. So I don't okay. actually focus abroad. I mean, postal making did start abroad, but um, my, my books focus on America. And so what I'm showing is, look, we've got banking and governments, banks and governments work together, right? This is not some like private market thing. B banks are a, um, it's a government enterprise, right? I mean, the way the money works, the, the, the you know, soft sort of um, cushion of the banking system is the Federal Reserve um, and monetary policy and, you know, the FDIC and the FHA and the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all of these systems that the government puts in place so the banks can run. And so that, you know, that, that, that system-wide approach allows for most of us to get our mortgage credit, our student loans, et cetera. And then there's this whole, you know, 40% of the country that has no access to that credit, right? Or if they do, they have to pay a lot more for it. They're just left out of this excess, right? So part of it is a racial story. And that's what I've told them. They, so you're saying they can't get student loans, they can't get car loans, they can't get mortgages. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So um, they, they uh, don't, it's a lot, you know, something like 30 something million people don't have a bank account, right? The banks just won't give them a bank account. So that's part of the story, right? So the postal banking idea, we actually had postal banking in America from 1910 until 1966. Um, um, as a way for small savers to save, you know, and um, actually it was Wallace Bennett of Utah um, who was opposed to that. They were banking. Utah has a really fascinating banking history, right? There, um, we have Fed chairs from Utah. We've got the banking commissioners, uh, the head of the Senate banking committee is Wallace Bennett and then his son, Bob Bennett. Um, so they, they have some good and bad policies, but a very strong uh, banking state. Um, so, so it ends in 1966, the postal banking service. How would someone have used uh, postal banking back in that time period? So you just, poor you know, you're poor, you have, you know, $500 to save, you go and you put it in a postal banking account, you get a, you know, bond and you, uh, that's your savings account, right? Um, and, and, and you keep that piece of paper somewhere. You keep it. It's it's logged somewhere. You can give it as a gift. Um, we and it appreciates. It appreciates over time. Yeah, yeah. They give you two percent, three percent return, just like a deposit. We used to. I mean, deposits used to give interest. Now they don't. But it, it used to be that you could, you know, 
make money by saving it. We and did, really did banks get rid of that? Did banks not want the competition? So they, they got rid um, of it or what? Yes. Uh, the postal banking system died at the hand of uh, bank lobbies um, in, in the 60s. And, and, you know, in the 60s, look, it, things were more equal then, right? People could get bank accounts. Even if you had just a little bit to save, there was enough, you know, there were enough community banks that served you. And now we don't have that system anymore. And so what I propose is, hey, let's bring this back. We have a post office in these, you know, disenfranchised locations that don't have banks anymore. Banks have since left that area. So for the past 10 years, we've had banks closing up um, where they're not profitable. And so I'm um, saying th those places are still served by the post office. And so has anybody, has anybody kind of taken you up on the idea? Has it been integrated at all? Um, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we have, to, uh, Senator Warren has endorsed it. Um, Bernie Sanders, it was in the Democratic National Platform. Um, I've talked with- That's amazing, right? I know. Oh, I know. It was amazing. So we have talked with Treasury. Um, we were in the works. We were in the process of, uh, you know, the highest level of the Treasury to get it a pilot started and get it going. And we were talking and then, you know, we had someone, someone else got elected. <laughs> we've now we've bigger fish to fry. We are now just trying to protect the banking system from, you know, who knows what sort of deregulatory efforts they're trying to, I mean, really it's, it's like we're back to square one. I can't even, uh, you know, it, 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 it was tough. Mm. Yeah. It was, uh, so, that so it was, election night must not have been fun for you from that perspective. It, it wasn't, you know, and um, there was, you know, career wise, it was rough, I think, because there was a lot going on for me. Um, and I was in talks, but I think more personally, I felt it like a punch in the gut career, uh, mm -hmm. that night. I mean, I felt like it really, I mean, I, it was, it was traumatic as a, a Muslim immigrant refugee, right? Like I felt like this was America telling me like, we don't want you. And, and it's still, I mean, it's still like, go between anger and just depression. And, and it, it, it was hard. It was hard to be told um, that no, America's better without you, you know? And I obviously know not everyone was saying that with their vote, but they were voting for a man who was saying that. So right, um, right. yeah. Um, and we do have Donald Trump supporters as listeners and we don't want people to feel like they're not welcome here. And I think it's important for people to be able to share how they experience, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these sorts of things. So, yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot of Donald Trump supporters who are part of my family, you know, and not my immediate, but, you know, and they, um, you know, will tell me that they didn't vote. They, you know, they saw it as a better of two options. They didn't have, an and I get it. I yeah, yeah. get it. I'm empathetic about why people might have voted for him that I don't take personally. Uh, Joanna, Joanna's listening. So shout out from Joanna. She writes, hello, beautiful learning something new every time I listen to you. So shout out to Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Uh, she's a friend of, of a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, I guess Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders aren't going away. So, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I guess these ideas are, are not dead. They just may be dormant for a few more years. I hope so. I okay. hope so. Yeah. Ta if talk about that second book. Give us some, give us some of the background, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the black communities. Tell, mm -hmm. tell us sort of what the situations were, uh, that that led to you strategizing about black banking and, and the racial wealth gap? Yeah, so I started discovering, you know, as I was looking at this postal banking history and I looked at the history of credit unions and thrifts and I started noticing that there's all these black banks. And I was like, what is this, right? So I dug into this history and I wanted, you know, I asked the librarian, this is way back at BYU, I started this research years ago. And I Really? Said, Why yeah, you're at BYU? Yeah, I started this research years ago and I asked the BYU librarian, hey, can you get me a book on black banks? You know, and he was like, no one's written about this. Like what? Like we have this history of black bank, I mean, thriving black banks. We have the Freedmen's Bank. We've got, you know, um, all the time of Jim Crow and segregation, there was a black banking sector going on. And so why has no one covered this? And so I started doing the research then. So that, that has been a longer term project. This postal banking book came out because it had to, because the moment was hot and I needed to push it out. But this is a, a longer burn that I've been working on for years. And, and, and really it's, you know, we've got these systems of segregation here. And the assumption was that, oh, well, black communities will just pool their resources and they will, you know, uh, fix the wealth gap and inequality through the same ways that, that the white community does. And what I'm showing in the book is when you have, you know, uh, credit policies that have, you know, that draw red lines around the ghetto, not don't lend there. Not only that, but like all sorts of barriers of, of finance and credit, like the way that Americans build generational wealth is through government supported credit. And when that doesn't flow into the black communities, we're going to create a wealth gap and that wealth gap is self-perpetuating. So even when those policies stop, that wealth gap is going to persist, right? So this is not a, uh, oh, black people are culturally inferior. They don't work hard enough. 
we have the game is rigged against them. They're, they're not going to be able to build wealth insofar as we have a segregated, unequal system. And, and once, you know, you need wealth to create more wealth, right? And so um, this is one of the tricks of capitalism is you need capital um, to grow it. And um, so I think, you know, that, that, that I show how it was that the capital shortfall started and how it kept perpetuating and what can be done. And part of it is, We've got to fix some of the problems that we have refused to fix, right? We refuse to talk about the legacy of slavery. We refuse to talk about the legacy of Jim Crow. We refuse to talk about the legacy of redlining. And these are fairly recent things. And we, we just kind of said, okay, well, you know, there's a free market. Good luck, you know, um, where that's not how um, – uh, segregation was created. Segregation was not a free market enterprise, right? That was a government policy. And so um, we have some double talk here on race. And I try to um, show some of that in the book through a history that is, you know, carefully analytical. I'm not, you know, I don't um, talk about, you know, um, white privilege in, in today. I just talk about how how it is that we have different systems and, and what that means for the races. Were there a couple, like I, I know you mentioned, I think you mentioned Nixon, were there a couple mm -hmm. policies or administrations that struck really hard blows to to black banking? Um, all of them. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny because even the heroes, like FDR, right, um, is a progressive hero, uh, struck the hardest blow to the black community, right, in um, cutting them out of the New Deal, you know. Um, Nixon also- how, um, did he, how did he cut them out of the New Deal? He created a federal government credit policy through the FHA and the HOLC that um, drew red lines and didn't lend into um, the uh, the black communities. He cut them off of the big sort of um, support of, you know, uh, domestic aid workers and farm workers who were black Southerners um, were, you know, eliminated. They couldn't get the, the That's thing. right. I remember Union that. protection. Um, and this is all because the South, he needed to, the South to pass the New Deal and the South uh, was heavily invested in Jim Crow, and they needed black economic subjugation. And so, uh, you you don't you know you don't pass the Senate, and there's you know there's uh, politics that goes uh, here into FDR chooses to pass the New Deal um, instead of uh, dealing in blacks, right? And so he left them out. Right. Okay. And any of the other major historical sort of um, Nixon? Yeah, Nixon diverts. You know, chooses a Southern strategy, and he kind of does double talk here, right? Instead of the civil rights, uh, sort of the tail end of the civil rights regime, and you know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all of these civil rights leaders are pushing hard for um, economic equality, right? Martin Luther King's whole message has been: look, even these laws are going to be empty if we're poor, you know. So his, you know, from the beginning, he had this consistent message that we need economic parity. Um, and, you know, toward the tail end of it, that becomes a much stronger message, right? The last movement he's going to make before he's assassinated is that he's going to do a poor march on Washington, right? Bring in the, these issues to Washington. And then, you know, Nixon gets elected in 68 and really subverts that, right? So there's this black power movement, black power meaning we want to control the economy of the ghetto, right? Um, fine, we'll take separatism, but we, we need some capital. And, um, and so he, what he does is he flips that and says, okay, black capitalism, what well, black capitalism I mean, so that was his, his big election promise was black capitalism instead of civil rights. He says, we're past civil rights. We're beyond that. We'll talk black capitalism. And so the thing he says is, you know, free markets, free markets are going to work for you. And, and, and the, you know, we'll give some money to these black banks. And so he supports black banks by putting deposits into them, but doesn't refuse to fix integration. And here, you know, this is an interesting story with George Romney, right? George Romney is Nixon's HUD um, president. And Romney is a real race hero here, right? He pushes hard within this very political Southern strategy administration, pushes hard for integration, right? Um, starts, you know, going behind Nixon's back to, to integrate, you know, um, uh, Warren, Michigan, and really gets backlash. Nixon keeps trying to push him out and get him to resign. And finally, he does resign, you know, in this resignation letter he sends to Nixon, like, you've taught me a lot about politics, you know? And so he... <laughs> And this he, is Mitt Romney's dad, former Romney's dad. governor, governor of Michigan, I guess, uh, George yeah, Romney, right? Yeah, Mormon. And, and, and you know, and, and everything I've read about him says, you know, his Mormon faith, like, led him to believe in doing what's right and, like, not what's politically right. He wouldn't stump for Goldwater, you know? He's like, Goldwater's not the way, and Nixon stumped for Goldwater, right? Goldwater, he also, did he oppose the church's policy on blacks in the priesthood? Sure. I mean, he really, yes, he did. You know, so really, the church and the country take these pivots, right? Because it's George Romney versus Ezra Taft Benson, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we went with, you know, the church is 
with Jeff Benson, but and it was George Romney and Nixon, right? I mean, George Romney has a stupid gaffe about Vietnam and doesn't get president. But if it had been George Romney as a Republican, it would have been a different country. I mean, I really think he was right on, more right than any Democrat that has come after him, more right than Carter, more right than Clinton. I mean, um, Romney got the inequalities. He talked about the white ghetto, the white um, neighborhoods putting a noose around the black ghettos. I mean, he really, his language is like, you know, if you, you are, am I listening to Cornell West? Am I listening to George Romney? I mean, really had this very striking language and he was just pushed out of that administration in two years um, and, 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 and sidelined, you know, and then since then, no, you, th- you think he would be a Mormon hero, but I'm sure the apostles that remained probably thought ill of him. And so he really hasn't been mentioned in Mormon circles for as long as I've been around. I don't know. I, I don't know what happened behind the scenes in the Mormon time, but I, I want someone to write a biography of George Romney here because I think George Romney is is one of the unsta- unsung heroes. I mean, and I'm, surely there's something there to, to object to, but really, I mean, his, he was even more forward than Johnson, I think. I mean, Johnson is a complicated figure, <laughs> you know? And if you've read the Robert Caro series on Johnson, which, which I would recommend to everybody. I have. I yes. have. Master of the Senate It's one of the best uh, books ever. One of the best books ever. Robert yeah, Caro, yeah. best writer America has Absolutely. ever. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you know, Johnson's a complicated guy, as you know. Um, and so, and and Nixon, I think, is is a politically calculating guy, but Romney um, was a zealot and uh, a, a moral, um, uh, you know, a clear moral thinker. And who knows what president the presidency would have done to him? But I really think it's a missed boat for the Republican Party and for the church. You know, um, we really, I think, Benson was, you know, obviously wrote a lot of things anti. Uh, and this is before he was prophet, but, you know, equated uh, Martin Luther King with communism. And, um, you know, it was John Bircher. And so this is the this is the Republican Party's choice at the time. And Nixon wasn't quite out there with, I mean, he ran, Mesut Benson, I think, ran with George Wallace, right, um, before he was prophet. So I don't, you know, it could have tempered his views afterwards, but um, uh, very politically on the right um, on race issues uh, in the Mormon church. And so I think that, doesn't help, I think, you know, as, as we're seeing the legacy of that kind of play out, um, doesn't help. Are you saying there's no biography of George Romney? Not, not a good one that okay. I know of. Okay, okay. You know, um, not, not one that relates, I mean, you really have to bring it to the present, right? Because I think um, part of reading George Romney and Goldwater in 1964 is, is looking at what the Republican Party is today, right? That was a, a fork in the road, um, a path not taken. And I think Trump is... Uh, the end result of where the Republican Party flipped from the sort of Rockefeller Romney Republicans to the Goldwater Nixon Republicans. So Southern strategy, it's sort of the racial dog whistling, and Trump is the embodiment of that. You know, um, Nixon was not Trump, but Nixon paved the way. You know, and Reagan uh, paved some more. Bush was a little bit of you know different, um, but but this is sort of Nixon coming home true. This is Goldwater. I mean, Goldwater made the playbook that Trump is following now. And he, you know, was the intellectual leader of that right wing sort of race stuff. I have to say when, when um, Mitt Romney was governor of Massachusetts, I had this optimism that he would follow in the footsteps of his dad Mm -hmm. and was super disappointed when he pragmatically so felt like he had to retrench uh, into conservatism to win the primaries and, and part of that is like what the Republican Party is. I mean, right. I, saw, yeah. I mean, I saw every primary debate and you just felt like, gosh, this is a race to the bottom. I mean, really, like yeah. you couldn't, you, know, you saw John McCain sell his soul. I mean, you see every, I mean, you have to um, p- pedal to this race space, you know, and I think it was unfortunate. Um, and I think, Ron, gosh, like, I mean, who wouldn't give an arm and a leg to have Romney as president now? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Have you seen the movie 13th? Yes, very good. So important. Very I can't good. I can't do a podcast without mentioning it. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's very uh, good. Okay, so um so Nixon uh s- supported black banking but in reality didn't give them the support they needed. Anything else you want to mention about black banking and its history that that um, just, just to give us a primer <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, really, it's this is a history. It's not of black banks. This is a history of capitalism and um, racism and how uh, that sort of um, barriers to banking, bar- barriers to w- wealth creation. You yeah, know, right. and, and I use banks as a model of what of, of of showing this. So it's not a book about banks, but but I bring in banks to sh- show the, the reality. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. Those are two really cool books. Um, what's it like uh, 
and um, yeah, what's it like to write books that are so timely, so important to what we're experiencing in the intersection of politics and race? And you really can't avoid religion when you talk about race mm -hmm. and politics. Um, it must be kind of rewarding to, to be a scholar in these areas. I, it is, you know, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's rewarding, but it's also, you know, um, it's hard. I mean, we don't read as much anymore. <laughs> like, I mean, people don't, people, I mean, I do, I, I love reading. I'm I just I've always been a reader, but, but, you know, I see the books on the bestseller list and every time I get so depressed because I'll read them and I'm like, this is not a work of scholarship. So I, you know, I'm always putting a plug in for like, read books that are well researched, read books that have footnotes, read books that are, you know, saying something. And so I, you know, my books don't, aren't super popular. They're not bestsellers. I'm not writing bestsellers, but I do wish that we would engage in, you don't have to read my book, but read books that are, that have a big historical scope that aren't just these like polemics, you know, I've, and I do, I'll read everything that's on the New York Times bestseller list. And I'm always disappointed by how narrow our thinking is. And I think we really, I mean, if we're talking about race, we've got to broaden the scope, you know, and I, I have, I had a lot of negative things to say about the right. I, I don't want to leave the left out of it here. Right. Like I think the left is, um, you know, uh, we have, have become tribalistic we have become um we we eat our own we don't like there's this sense of like the progressive like no one's progressive enough you know and and i i'm worried you know i consider myself a solid member of the left you know and i think we just but but i, I i'm increasingly um concerned about the language that we're using the people that we're ostracizing the the way that we're talking about the other side you know and i don't this is not like some message of like kumbaya like let's love everybody but like really like it's you know i think we have to look at structures and not feelings this is not about you know um uh, identity and this is again like I think we, we have to get away from this feeling of like if I am hurt that means that you are bad you know um, I think you know think thinking more broadly thinking historically thinking structurally what are the structural problems and how can I be involved and who can join me to fight these structural problems as opposed to like you know how do I feel about this person saying this thing about me and I, I see this you know a lot in these forums that sometimes I go go on and I you know I don't want to be a crank here but it's 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 hard you know it's hard to see um uh some of it you want practical solutions not not uh you know politically correct wars and yeah. you know yeah politics of uh derision and exclusion etc right